So John, should we get yeah. started? Yeah. Sure. All right, so welcome everyone to uh, Friday Grand Rounds. This uh, week um, is on low vision. And that's my pleasure to welcome uh, both Dr. Samuel Markowitz and Dr. Monica Favorite Nido to uh, to lead this round today, along with our um, uh, resident and fellow representatives. So, just a brief introduction, and uh, apologize while I switch the screen here. So, Dr. Markowitz uh, actually graduated from the Hebrew University and Hadassah School of Medicine in Jerusalem, Israel. He did his residency and fellowship in glaucoma at the University of Toronto. And he's uh, extensively published uh, on numerous areas in low vision, including uh, PRL, <clears throat> uh, micropermetry, and uh, many features of low vision. Dr. Uh, Monica Dibert-Nido graduated from the University of San Paulo in Brazil and uh, is a pediatric ophthalmologist who specialized in low vision rehabilitation. Her fellowship was here at the University of Toronto with Dr. Markowitz. And she's the educational lead of the Committee of Visual Rehabilitation of the Canadian Ophthalmological Society. Uh, she sees patients of all ages for low, re re low vision rehabilitation uh, at the Toronto Western Hospital and affiliated clinics. So welcome. Thank you guys very much for presenting today. Uh, we appreciate you showing us that there's much more to low vision than Kestenbaum's rule. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lloyd, for the introduction. Uh, today we're going to speak about the low vision rehabilitation post-brain injury. It's a very common theme in our office, in our clinics, but many times we don't know what to do, or we may think there is nothing to be done. But there is much to be done, as we are going to see here today. We are going to show examples and what's behind that. So I'd like to call Dr. Michael Popovic to present the first case. Perfect. Well, thank you so much, uh, Dr. De Bernido. Um, and thank you for your, your support and also the support of Dr. Markowitz and uh, Yulia Pietova, your fellow, for, for their help and assistance with this presentation. Um, so I'm one of the PGY2 residents, and I'll, I'll jump right into my uh, case here. Um, before we begin, there's no, no financial interest in this talk for, for anyone. So we have the case of a 35-year-old gentleman who suffered a, a stroke post-endocarditis a, a year ago. Um, on the right side and developed a left-sided homonymous uh, hemianopsia. Um, he, initially, when he presented to the, to the um, vision rehab uh, clinic, he had issues with uh, near reading, as well as splitting of fixation, which limited his intermediate gaze with respect to faces and TV. Uh, we also found that, um, you know, uh, as a goal, uh, improving his orientation and mobility uh, would be a, a good next step. So in terms of uh, his initial assessment, uh, he was seeing 2020 at distance initially, though at near, he was about 2025 with the uh, critical print size, meaning that um, you know, when he came to the 2020 line, his reading speed was actually quite reduced. Um, and so he was only able to get to the 2025 line um, at a normal reading speed. Uh, he, there was also his uh, um, stereo test was also kind of borderline at 40, um, where the where the normal in, in adults is typically uh, less than than 20 on the frisbee test. Looking at his um, visual fields, he had a dense left-sided uh, homonymous hemianopsia, uh, corresponding to the location of the stroke. And so then the question became. What can we do for this gentleman? I, I think in um, you know post-stroke uh, visual field defects, there's sometimes this prevailing idea that you know not much can really be done, and that uh, you know whatever deficit they have, the patient just needs to learn to adjust and learn to live with. Um, in this case, you know we we thought that to improve his visual function and to improve his quality of life. Um, trying with prism um, glasses would be a good next step. And so the idea was if he had a left-sided homonymous hemianopsia, uh, directing prisms in such a way as to optimize the right-sided visual field that he still has um, would be important. Um, so when prescribing prism glasses, the idea is that the image is shifted towards the apex of the prism. And so 
Therefore, we wanted to, to add prism glasses that were base in in the right eye and base out in the left. Typically, uh, the vision uh, rehabilitation specialist starts with a, a low uh, correction, like one to two prism diopters, and, and gradually works their way up from there up to about six prism diopters is, is typically the maximum. Um, more than that, you, you run into issues where the image is being distorted outside of uh, fixation. So in his case, uh, we, we felt that um, you know, six prism diopters um, afforded him a, uh, an uh, improvement to his visual function. Uh, he remained at 2020 with this correction and he felt subjectively that he could see faces sharper and, and read the TV better. At NIR also, we trialed um, uh, an ad of, of uh, three diopters um, where with that ad, he was able to read the 2020 line at a normal reading speed. And not only were uh, prisms integrated into both of his lenses on both sides, but also um, uh, Dr. Markowitz and, and his team have been trialing the use of Fresnel prisms. So basically stick on prisms onto existing glasses um, as a way of optimizing the visual function of, of patients with uh, homonymous hemianopsias. The idea is that, you know, with a left-sided homonymous hemianopsia, the right eye visual field loss um, on the nasal side is somewhat, com is somewhat uh, compensated by the, right, uh, by the left eye nasal field. However, um, the, the visual field that's lost on the, left <clears throat> on the left eye is that temporal field and that's really the one that, um, that limits his orient orientation and mobility. And so what was done then was the, ad the addition of two Fresnel prisms on only over the left eye, and they were oriented in, in such a way to optimize his function. So essentially one prism was um, placed superiorly and one inferiorly. Um, the superior prism was uh, done base out at 30 degrees, meaning that the uh, supertemporal field um, was directed more uh, infranasally. And then for the inferior prism, the um, infratemporal, infratemporal field was directed uh, more supranasally um, uh, and, and the prism uh, was therefore positioned at about 150 degrees in the inferior segment. And again, uh, with this addition, he felt um, subjectively that there was better awareness of his left fields. So to summarize, um, he was given a, a prescription in uh, both eyes of six prism diopters um, base, um, base in on the right and base out on the left, and, and then the addition of this uh, uh, Fresnel uh, prism set as well. When the patient was seen three months later in follow-up, he felt that, that he could see better uh, over that left side. He was noticing objects and people um, in, a, in a better way. And so his orientation and mobility had definitely improved. Um, his splitting of fixation was also better with respect to TV and, and faces and, and more intermediate tasks. And then at near, again, he was able to um, fully read the 2020 line at a normal speed uh, relative to before the prisms when he was, uh, you know, having some difficulty and some slowing of his reading speed um, at that uh, uh, line. So, you know, it's, it's unfortunate that um, vision rehabilitation is, is not necessarily offered at uh, all centers across the world. And um, again, you know, in these patients with, with hemianopsias, um, there's, there's this prevailing thought that nothing can really be done. And, 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 you know, it's exciting that in the vision rehabilitation space, there's all of these additions and manipulations and changes that are being made to offer uh, patients an improvement in their visual function and to optimize their quality of life with the remaining vision that they have. When we think of um, visual field defects post-stroke, uh, you know, we go into this extensively, but, you know, depending on where the lesion is exactly, uh, that will dictate the type of visual field defect that, that's observed. And so eventually, you know, there, there can be certain visual field defects that, that are in unique patterns or in more, more complex patterns. And not to belabor the, the point that different uh, stroke presentations can lead to different visual field defects, but the relation to the uh, visual rehabilitation 
is also important. So, you know, if um, if this gentleman had presented with a, a similar homonymous hemianopsia that was macular sparing, um, those yoked prisms, uh, you know, we may try the Fresnel prisms, but not necessarily the, the yoked prisms that he was offered. Uh, if the situation again had changed and he had a bitemporal hemianopsia from a chiasmal lesion, um, you know, the thought is there to potentially try Fresnel prisms to both eyes um, as a way of optimizing the temporal fields uh, on both sides. And so uh, it's really st staggering when you look at the burden of the uh, of disease in our population, over 1 million Canadians have uh, hemianopsia. It's a very common um, condition and something that we see in our clinics um, very often. Uh, and I think something that, uh, you know, visual rehabilitation uh, definitely presents an exciting opportunity to, to help in the management of these uh, patients. Typically, the, the uh, main problems that these patients encounter are first, as we touched on, the parafoveal field loss, uh, which leads to what's called a hemianopic alexia, meaning that when these patients read individual words, typically they're able to do quite well, but when they start reading passages of text, um, you know, that, that visual slowing uh, really becomes pronounced. Um, they also have issues with uh, impaired saccades and their midline is also shifted, leading to issues around recognizing the external environment and their spatial exploration. So I'll just leave it there for now and um, and let Dr. Daybert Nido go into a, a, a further, a little bit further discussion on the use of prisms um, in this setting. Thanks very much for your time. Thank you, Dr. Popovi. Yes. Uh, thank you for your talk. So this is very complex, as we know, right? Uh, when you have a brain lesion, it can be in different places, which will result in different uh, clinical pictures. For instance, we know that the uh, dorsal vi uh, visual pathway, when it's uh, affected, there is a spatial perception loss. So they, they don't know where the object is, but when the ventral uh, pathway is affected, there is a recognition problem. So they don't know what it is. And also uh, stereopsis problems may occur from V2 lesions. Uh, everybody knows convergent uh, fusion problems and ocular motility from midbrain lesions and so on. There are many kinds of contrast for uh, posterior brain lesions. So in summary, for each task they want to perform like uh, walking around, seeing binocularly, uh, reading, there are a few visual functions involved, and we have a combination of functions affected. So we can have in our intake all kinds of complaints, but usually we have peripheral field loss, which is a difficulty to walk around. Patient cannot go to the grocery shop uh, by himself. They have to have someone from the family together. Uh, reduced vi uh, central visual acuity, we may think, uh, oh, they can see from the other side uh, of the fields and they can see 2020. What's the problem then? Uh, the problem is very complex. There is a parafoveal loss, as Dr. Popovic said, and this impairs their ocular uh, movements and they cannot fixate accurately. So the images seem jumbled. They tell us, oh, I see a little bit blurry. It's somehow uh, weird, I can't see very well, but this is because of the hemianopia. Uh, many of them have cognitive deficits, which makes it difficult for us to get to the rehabilitation. So we have to make an effort to figure out, uh, but we can do uh, interventions as well. The, uh, this uh, loss of dependence um, that they have the falls, the risk of falls they present, the poor navigation on the screen, they uh, translate into a depression because the patients don't uh, have the ability to read on the computer, to read the newspapers, to go shop by themselves. So there is a high level of depression in these patients. And one of the most regret functions that they lose is driving. 
the uh, license is not allowed for amenopia because the Ontario regulation requires 120 degrees uh, in the horizontal field, as you know, and 15 degrees vertically. Uh, but there is another program, a waiver program, that eventually they can go to and apply to drive in certain conditions, not in regular conditions, not a regular license, but they, they can go to familiar places during the daylight. Uh, it depends on the level of the patient of functionality. And the low vision rehabilitation specialist has to participate writing to the, to the ministry the condition of the patient. If we think they have condition to drive or not, and from there, the ministry will decide about the case. Um, so how many uh, patients recover post-stroke, for example? Not many, 50% um, more or less may recover from stroke. But if this is about to happen, it occurs in the first three months. So uh, when should I send my patient to the rehabilitation? Should I wait three months or not? So no, you don't need to wait three months. Uh, actually, they can go as soon as possible because they will always have some needs that we can address in the rehab. Um, for instance, temporary glasses for reading or uh, orientation mobility prisms. And there are some papers uh, that show already that the early rehabilitation may benefit the patients uh, increasing a little bit the percentage of recovery if not total, at least partial. So the interventions that we work with can be optical, uh, can be substitution when we use something to, to show to the patient another image, compensatory when we try to compensate for the ocular motor movements that they lose, the saccades, uh, or it can be substitution like wearing a cane. Uh, they can be restitution. We can train the patients to really restore part of the visual fields. So all these exist. In our service, we work more with the optical solutions and biofeedback training, which is compensatory solution. Field restoration, we are starting research on this area with Dr. Michael Ribeiro uh, from the Cranberry Institute. He's a PhD specialized in uh, superior colloquial research. And also we started uh, to work with him. So, but basically today we're going to show our cases on optical solutions and biofeedback training. The compensation uh, treatments, they have the greater, greatest results uh, in terms of answer, time answer for the light stimulus. Uh, also they, they reward more the, the patients. So I learned about the, the prisms with Dr. Markowitz when I came for fellowship. I was used to them from the strabismus to correct diplopia with another concept, right? Uh, here, the prisms, they work to dislocate the fields to bring the image to a better place. So we put the prisms in a trial frame uh, and we see how much they like. We try to put as less as possible. Up to 75% of our patients, they like to, uh, they like and adjust well to these prisms, to the yoked. Actually, in, I see much more than 75%. This is in the literature. And the prisms, they may also improve not only the reading or faces, but they may also improve the balance, the posture, nausea, sensation, or dizziness related to the amenopia. So the way it works, it's physics, basically, deviating the, the light towards the base. The image goes towards the seeing field of the patient. In amenopia, the patients have a mismatch between the objective and subjective midline. So they perceive the, the midline in a different place because of the amenopia. And the prisms, they correct it to the brain. So the yoke prisms are a permanent total field displacement, but we can also have an intermittent peripheral field displacement. Uh, this is a true field expansion. We are going to work here with higher uh, values of prisms in segments. They can be a whole segment or a Fresnel segment. And we paste it 
uh, at the back of the glasses in the peripheral part with base out. So this base out will bring the, the images close to the fovea, but not exactly at the fovea. It has to be 20 degrees away from the fovea. I don't know if you can see there, there is a stop sign on the right at the, at the top of the picture. Is it possible to see this, this image, right? So these uh, segments, they bring the, the image causing some diplopia and the image will come intermittently calling the patient's attention to the objects, to the obstacles. Uh, so it's tolerable, but not for all the patients. I see more or less 50% like this kind of prisms, but 50% don't tolerate or don't notice this extra image coming. Uh, if they have neglect, they won't notice. If they have some cognitive deficits, sometimes they don't pay attention to this image. So this may happen, or they may not tolerate the diplopia simply, then we cannot use it. This is an example of a patient using the segments. Uh, we use unilateral because it promotes a better field expansion. The disparity between the, the images is greater like this. And the patient does not, doesn't see the image uh, as strong or sharp as the central. They see something lighter or blurry like a shadow and it makes them to turn the face towards the object. It calls their attention. It's more or less like a patient with glaucoma who never needs the orientation mobility because towards the years, uh, across the years, they use the scanning movements and they adjust to the field loss, peripheral field loss. But here the patient loses the vision uh, accurately. So with the prisms, they may start doing these saccades towards the lost field. Uh, and eventually they may dis dismiss this kind of prisms in the future when they adjust. It's possible to be done for uh, bitemporal uh, amenopia. It's the same concept based out in both eyes. Here's the, just to illustrate, we don't need to know by heart. Uh, on the left superior uh, figure, there is a amenopia patient. So below that is uh, the presence of two Fresnel prisms with the axis vertical at 90 degrees. It relocates the images uh, segments like that. If we put them uh, oblique at 30 degrees, the images go down a little bit, getting closer, they will bring more central aw awareness, but not phobia awareness, 20 degrees awareness. And uh, if we approach them, like usually we do 11 millimeters, 12, if we put on the glasses nine uh, of height apart, we may have almost the central awareness, but this is very hard to tolerate because they may start getting bothered. It's just an example in the Pelly's paper. And now I'd like to call Jean uh, Quinn to, to present us the second case. Uh, Monica, before we go on to the second case, or as Jenny's putting her slides up, so everybody is hopefully aware, as you mentioned, that uh, patients who have a hemianopia or other field defects are able to apply for the vision waiver program, which actually includes, typically they must go for a, a road test to demonstrate, and then there's other things that they do. They put them through an obstacle course. Um, but I'm trying to understand, when, when, when they wear these yoked prisms, can they then drive with the prisms on? Yes, they can drive because they adjust to, to the prisms. The problem here is not the central vision, but the peripheral and the yoke prisms don't really improve this, uh, this angle of vision they have. So they can drive even with the field expansion prisms, but what they have to do is to pass the road test. This is the most important. And we ourselves, we have to feel that the patient is adjusted, has some condition, minimum condition to, to drive but the road test will tell better to the ministry. Um, I think Dr. Marco, can you stop your slide share or Monica, can you stop your slide share? Who was ever yeah. sharing so Jane can get up, yeah. Uh, can I make a comment, <laughs> please? Yes, of course. Um, so um, just to clarify what uh, John was just mentioning, uh, driving in Ontario for that purpose in Canada, 
is uh, not allowed with low vision devices. Recently in Quebec, they started to allow, in some cases, telescopic devices like they use in the States. So we are talking here about the devices for the purpose of rehabilitation. And if the patient uh, goes um, to the ministry, they have to, to take uh, their license with regular glasses. They wouldn't allow them with anything else. So, um, but uh, basically the examination for the, from the ministry, it's to establish establish um, um, what they can do, what are the ability, what are the abilities uh, in a regular way. And obviously there will be limited to a certain extent which will be detected. Nevertheless, the ministry has the authority to grant them a, a license. It's called the waiver program with those uh, limitations. So just to clarify um, uh, this point. Actually, Sam, what you're trying to clarify that, though, I, I still don't understand because, you know, if I have a patient who has a bit of diplopia and I correct it with prisms in his glasses, he can show up at the ministry and he can drive with his glasses. So, so if they're able to adjust to yoked prisms, it's just a pair of glasses with the, I mean, couldn't they just show up with those on? The ministry wouldn't know. It's just weird looking glasses. Well, uh, I know what you say, diplopia, it's kind of a long, um, situation preceding many, many things. Um, but what I'm talking, it's about um, uh, when they do the testing, basically, there are a few things. They have to do a field test and they have to do a road test. So um, when they go uh, on the road, obviously they'll tell them, you wear glasses, please put the glasses on. But when they test them, they, they will say, no, ju just how you would do your test without uh, prism glasses or other things, just regular glasses. If you have prisms incorporated, probably yes. If you have Fresnel prisms, um, probably not. Um, yeah. Okay, so I guess I'll go on to the second case and um, introduce the second part of the talk. Um, so we'll talk about this 68 year old female and she had suffered the stroke a couple of years ago, which left her with a left hemianopia. In terms of her vision rehabilitation goals, she had a slight vertical diplopia. Um, it was slight, but still bothersome to her. In terms of orientation mobility, because of the left hemianopia, she was bumping into objects on the left and also had problems with near reading as well. All in all, this gave her problems with balance and dizziness. Looking at her initial low visit, uh, vision assessment, you can see with the current prescription that she had, she was seeing about 20-40 in each eye. There's a slight cataract in each eye, which uh, may have affected the visual acuity as well. For near reading, she was seeing 20-25, which is okay, but she had, a qu she had quite a low reading speed, and because of the left hemianopia, was missing words on the left side of the page. For her ocular mobility and alignment assessment, you can see that she has a slight right hypertropia of about two prison diopters. And so this brings us to the second part of the talk, which is looking at different ways of vision rehabilitation. And so I'll introduce the concept of microperimetry and microparametric projection technology. And this is used for residual visual function assessment where the stimuli are projected directly onto the retina rather than onto a screen in front of the eye. And you can get accurate uh, test and retesting of the same retinal point by using uh, special eye tracker technology, which is incorporated into some of these microperimeters. But there's different types of or brands of microperimeters that are out there, things like uh, Optos, the NIDAC MP1, which are one of the earlier ones that are on the market, and then the Maya, which are some of the newer ones that are on the market uh, that combine high frequency eye trackers um, with the technology that they have. And in terms of instrument abilities, these microperimeters are not only able to just produce these parametric records, but they can identify a preferred retinal locus or PRL and residual functional retinal area or locus. So with the loss of central vision, there are functional adaptations that occur. And this is done by the brain to reduce the impact of the resulting disabilities and also to maximize or enhance the residual functional vision. 
And one of these adaptive strategies is to develop an eccentric retinal area that will assume the lost macular function. And this represents the PRL or preferred retinal locus um, and the residual functional locus. And these microperimeters are not able only to uh, create the microperimetry records and identify these PRLs, but also create accurate estimates of fixation stability. So as we just talked about, one adaptation to the loss of macular function involves using that specific and developing that specific PRL. But one thing that's also needed is to achieve good fixation stability at that PRL. And this fixation stability can be measured by these microperimeters by measuring the extent of the area that is covered by the fixation points. And so we can see here, these are some of the records that are produced by microperimetry. You can see that there is an exact scotoma that is mapped out by the microperimeter. And you can see the real size of the scotoma rather versus in like Humphrey visual fields, you just see that there are reduced fields and like an, a scotomatous area. You can also see the preferred retinal locus that is mapped out by the microperimeter. It's this area that is outlined here and it's, you can see all these little green dots inside which represent fixation attempts and the PRL is the union of all of these areas. So going back to the patient, we can see her microperimetry baseline results. You can see the left hemianopsia, uh, hemianopia that she had. You can see it's not quite symmetrical in both eyes and it's not a perfect vertical line, which is typical. Uh, looking at the fixation stability, which is represented by BCEA, you can see that it is impaired, especially in the right eye. It's 4.3 squared degrees. Normal is about 0 0.5. So in the left eye, she has 0 0.8 square degrees, which is still slightly impaired. Retinal sensitivity is also decreased in both eyes at 11.9 decibels. Normal is about 23 or more. And you can also see that the microperimeter is able to measure her baseline PRLs. So each of these little green dots, again, represents a fixation attempt. So you can see that during the test, the patient is moving around because you see these area, this area of green dots. And the larger the area, the more unstable the fixation. You can also see the direction in which the patient attempts to fixate, as shown by this arrow. So the eye tries to use the more functional area um, that she has in order to fixate, but like the brain and the muscles don't have the skills necessary to keep the eye steady at this point. And this results in reading alexia because the image was cut and also the movements aren't steady enough for her to be able to read it or find the new area consistently to successfully read it. And now this brings us to the, again, the second part of the talk, which is looking at biofeedback training for vision rehabilitation and low vision. Um, again, the adaptive strategy when patients lose a lot of their central vision and with low vision is to use this eccentric retinal viewing area, but this also depends on ocular motor abilities, which is often imperfect. So during biofeedback training, you have light and audio signals and feedback mechanisms that help to change the visual perception and the ocular motor control so that it becomes more second nature when the stimuli isn't there and then they can improve their vision that way. It's often used for things like AMD, where it impacts central vision. You can see there is a blue area here, which is the new PRL, which is chosen to be more advantageous than the old one, which is close to the area of scotoma. And just going through this video, you can see the process that the patients undergo when they do this biofeedback training. A little bit to the left. Yeah, move your eyes to the left. Slowly to the left. Higher. You're getting there. Listen to the beat. Good. To the left now. Just move. To yeah, that's the way you should see. You see? Try to stay there. Good. Up. To the left. Up. Get in there. Little bit to the left. Little bit to the left. Up. <clears throat> Good. To the left. Yes. Get in there. Good. Yes. 
yes. A little bit. So you can hear the, the audio feedback that the patient gets when they're training. And this is what was done for the patient that the that is this case. She underwent four weekly sessions of this biofeedback training, which were 20 minutes each. Um, and it's trained her to use a better area in her retina uh, to be the PRL. And you can hear that there's audio feedback when they get closer to the PRL, you can hear the beat becomes more continuous and prolonged. Um, and uh, an area was chosen which had a better retinal sensitivity area. Uh, it was quite close to the fovea because she was still reading at 2025. So of course the fovea gives a good central vision. We don't wanna to stray too far away from it. And so she went, she underwent these biofeedback sessions. And then one week afterwards, you can see the improvement that she had. So an area was selected, like perhaps one of the more yellow or like orange areas that had um, better retinal sensitivity. And she was trained to use that um, to become her PRL. And you can see one week post training, there is a relocation of the fields. It's not a restoration of the fields, but you can see uh, the relocation of the fields and the transitional area that has shifted. As a result, her fixation stability improved. So one point from 4.3 to 1.2, which is about like four times better. The retinal sensitivity improved to 16.1 and the paracentral retinal sensitivity, which are the average of the values in these two columns in the center, also improved to 24.3. So there was a great improvement in reading in the end. And you can see just highlighting these areas, the areas in, um, outlined in red, greater retinal sensitivity in these areas, more like yellow and green dots, and the fixation stability improved, which is denoted by these areas of these little green dots because it's a smaller area, so greater fixation stability achieved after the biofeedback training. Um, and this just shows it graphically as well. You can see the uh, retinal sensitivity improved pre to post and fixation stability improved pre to post training as well. You can see with the different shades of the blue, there's a slight relocation of the fields and all these little green dots show the improvement in her sensitivity. And even eight months after biofeedback training, you can see that there are sustained results from this biofeedback training. She was seeing larger fields and was very satisfied. Her visual acuity was about the same um, at, in the distance. Again, she had that small cataract, but at near now she was seeing 2020 and she was no longer missing the beginning of the sentences. She had that slight diplopia as well, which she was given uh, some prisms for, but even without the prisms after biofeedback training, she was able to fuse without the prisms. And her diplopia and that tropia came about because there was a decompensation of a pre-existing phoria prior to the stroke, but then after the stroke and with the loss of the paracentral field, um, she was, she, the phoria had decompensated. But you can see after the training, she was still able to fuse again without the prisms, though the prisms were still given for comfort. Um, so I'll uh, pass it over to Dr. Uh, Divert Nido to just talk a little bit more about biofeedback training. Thank you, Dr. Quinn. just getting there. So uh, I'm going to talk about biofeedback training, which is my favorite intervention. I do for most of the low vision conditions to see how they improve. And many, uh, most of them improve because we're working with fixation stability, which is directly related to the central visual acuity. And uh, we do it a lot. Every resident or fellow who goes to the low vision for the a placement with us, knows how to do the biofeedback. And Dr. Piatova, uh, our fellow, is doing with me all the time. So as Dr. Jen told, uh, we are relocating the fixation to a more, more favorable location, a better place on the retina. It can be central loss, amyanopia, or even a peripheral loss. When they lose the stability, we can also choose a better position for them to use. So here, uh, there are papers describing that in amenopia, the fixation stability is affected. It, it is shown in the literature. That was when we had the idea to try the biofeedback. So I always want to invent something new and it's working. So far, it's been good for the patients. 
it facilitates the saccade control uh, and does that field relocation, as you saw. So here's the rationale to uh, the patient usually uh, fixate with the transitional area scotoma. Transitional scotoma area is this green one, the, the red part, but we have to relocate the fixation to the green part. We do one to three degrees of relocation. Uh, the biofeedback stimulates the patient in a uh, bimodal way. It's audio and luminous. So this uh, kind of stimuli, they go to the superior colliculus because it's multimodal. And the superior colliculus amplifies this answer to the brain, probably uh, opening suppressed areas on the brain from these green areas that are not used by the patients. And then the brain uh, starts to recognize these new points and seeing better. And uh, it's a permanent change. It's the patient doesn't lose the effects from the training. So why we cannot relocate too much? This is because of the cone presence uh, concentrated in the fovea, as we see here. With one millimeter of relocation, we are deviating 3.6 degrees, but there we'll have only 0 0.2, uh, only 20% of the cones. So relocating 1.5 or two, I still keep 50% to 80% of the cones that the patient has to use for a sharp vision. Uh, the reason why it is permanent is due to brain plasticity, even in adults, not only in children, right? We have shown here before, just to remember about this beautiful study where Schumacher uh, studied the MRI in patients who lose their central vision. So he showed that this green circle, which is a PRL, a peripheral center that the patient uh, was not using, started to be used for fixation. And after that, this area in the cortex where it was represented uh, also changed for the central cortical representation. So I'd like Dr. Piatova to comment on this case, please. It's just an example uh, of another patient as she works all the time with me, only the audio, I need her to open. Um, do you hear me? Yes. <laughs> Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Nino. So uh, this is a young gentleman, uh, post stroke, and um, he had a visual field loss, as you see here on the pictures. And we trained him a couple of months ago with biofeedback training. The patient had um, really good visual acuity, like 20-20 for each eye, but he had problems uh, with reading because he, he was missing words when he uh, tried to read. And also he had some um, discomfort with orientation and mobility. So this patient received uh, four sessions, um, sorry, five sessions uh, of biofeedback training for 20 minutes each. And you can see here the micro perimeter uh, images before, like a baseline before treatment. Um, you may see uh, the really uh, big, um, red area, uh, especially transitional one, and the fixation stability is a bit unstable. So those small um, blue uh, dots uh, with the black error uh, shows the fixation stability and it's uh, located um, directly at the borderline between good and uh, bad visual field. So after the training, um, you may see more green areas because of the visual field relocation and uh, fixation stability is much more stable and it allows uh, to see sharper, better and um, more stable, um, especially for reading. The patient mentioned uh, after the biofeedback training that uh, he can read much easier, faster, and he's more confident because he stopped missing the words during the reading. And also uh, it is much, easier for him uh, with orientation and mobility because he uh, noticed uh, that the um, uh, angle is a bit wider when he tries to look at someone. Be for example, he said that before he couldn't see the shoulders of the uh, person in front of him, but after by feedback training, he, uh, he could do it. So he was really satisfied with uh, the training and the results. Thank you, Dr. Nito. Thank you, Dr. Piatova. Yesterday we were together, Dr. Piatova and I, 
just to make it short, <laughs> there was a young patient. Uh, he was seen 20 over 100 with the best correction post uh, amenopia. It was a cancer a post surgery case. And the patient was uh, listening to audio books. He was not able to read at all. And I got very surprised because we did his microperimetry in the Davenport office. And it was like that on the left, more or less like this. And then we started to try prisms with two prisms, he improved from to 2040, but with three prisms, he improved to 2025 for distance. And for near, without any ad, he could read 2020. Uh, so it was very <laughs> impressive, a patient who was listening to all the books, intelligent uh, student, okay, who improved like that. So no matter if it's prisms or biofeedback, we can try any of those and we can choose which one suits your patient. And not only amenopia, but other cases of brain injury. For instance, this patient post-stroke has a CVI, cortical visual impairment with a different pattern. And in the microperimetry, we identify she's fixating with the bed area, right? The affected area was relocated. And then from 2040 of vision, she went to 2020 for distance and for reading near close. Fixation stability from 1.3 to 0.4. So we have numbers and graphs showing the results. It's very impressive for me. <laughs> Okay, and this is the result of our first nine patients that we did. We are doing more, and we are about to be approved from the REB to start a prospective study. But from our pilot, we could see that the fixation stability is improved significantly, P0016, right? Yeah. And uh, all the other variables tend to improve as a retinal sensitivity, paracentral retinal sensitivity, which are the two columns around the, the fixation. And the numbers of points not seen in the microperimetry was also reduced. So we now need to do more studies uh, about this, studying also the contrast, the stereopsis, the quality of life questionnaires that we are planning to do. And there is also a very good uh, promise of work with Dr. Michael Robert from the Cranberry uh, Institute, where we are going to adjust the virtual reality training after biofeedback. So the patients will be able to expand periphery as well, because the virtual reality is supposed to cause a restoration of the rest of the field, not a big area, but at least some more uh, area for the patient. And all these makes a real difference. Okay, so thank you. If you have any questions, we are here. So once again, I'll lead off with a question. I, I, I find it quite astonishing that uh, four or five sessions of merely 20 minutes a piece is sufficient to affect a permanent change. That's very impressive. What, what is, so Jenny showed us some biofeedback in action, we could see something happening and the patient looking, trying to look into that area. But what, what does the patient see? That looks like what the doctor sees. What, what does the patient see when they do the test or the they training? See, they see only a red circle and they have to let it go because they will now move the eyes and not fixate at the circle. When they achieve the, the new PRL, the TRL, then the circle comes back uh, for this new position. Then they see a white dot inside the circle, a shiny white light that is the light uh, stimulus. I don't know if Dr. Markowitz wants to compliment. He was. <laughs> yeah, mostly it's a skill which the patients learn to move their eyes in a certain direction and they have to remember it. The guideline for that is twofold. One is the audio guideline, and but visual, it's basically that circle which they try to concentrate on it and and um, and see it all the time. Uh, basically, what those patients experience without any training, many will tell you they see a target but it misses. They, it comes back and goes, comes and goes. This way, they say, yeah, I could see the target all the time. So um, that, that's, 
when they are on. And is there anything the patient can do at home to supplement this training? Like, can they, I don't know, draw things on a paper and try to, you know, practice? Is that possible? Uh, Monica? <laughs> well, yes. We used to um, go uh, give them for home uh, reading exercise so they could train this PRL, this new function. And uh, now we're starting to work with iFitness, a technology to train the vision uh, online from home. There are many kinds of exercise that we can do. We can do in the office as well. We're going to start with our occupational therapy student, a very nice one. She's starting this exercise in the office as well. And also I have the experience not to prescribe anything. So if we don't do anything at home, many of them keep the good results, which is quite impressive, but they do. Um, then we can also re uh, reinforce the training six months after if they lose, if they don't lose, that's it. So it depends on the patient, but many studies are needed, right? To, to decide which kind of training is better for each kind of pathology or patient, in my opinion. So, Alan, you have your hand up, Dr. Solnovec. Oh, sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> there is a question here from Dr. Michelli in the chat box, so I'll read it out for him. Uh, what level of feedback is there for biofeedback training? Or is there what level of evidence is there for biofeedback training? And uh, is it randomized studies or is it investigational at the moment? Okay, good. Hi, Dr. Michelli. Thank you for your patience you send every week. Uh, yes, biofeedback is, uh, well, there is evidence for low vision in general. So we have studies for macular degeneration. We did one for nystagmus in children. So Dr. Filippo Mori from uh, Italy, he has studies, big ones. So we are walking towards the validation. But is still in a research project because for amyanopia, we don't have studies about this. It's our kind of our initiative here in the department. So we need to, to prove that, yeah. Uh, um, can, I, can I add? So biofeedback is a technology which was initially developed in Italy for probably for the last 15 years started uh, immediately with the introduction of the NIDEC micro perimeter. And there are many, many studies actually published, mostly from Italy, but now since micro perimeters are more available for different parts of the world. Um, there, there are no um, um, in, in brackets good studies, but mostly there are case reports or mini series. Uh, the bottom line is they all show that there are benefits from improving, um, from improving function. Um, in essence, what biofeedback does, and it reinforces what we know from other studies from loss of central vision with macular degeneration, biofeedback proved again that uh, one could improve fixation stability, ocular motor functions. And there are separate studies uh, for which show that improvement of fixation stability, uh, most of those studies are in macular degeneration, improve significantly or are directly related to improving visual function. So there is quite a solid uh, body of evidence that uh, improving fixation stability improves vision and uh, biofeedback basically improves fixation stability with the net result of improving vision. Uh, I think Alan does have his hand up this time. <laughs> I can hear Alan, you. we can't hear you. There's an issue with your mic. How much of this is, is this better? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. okay. How much of the, uh, ability to adapt to this is based on neuroplasticity or neuroadaptation. And is this in any way related to age of the patient? Younger patients usually are a little bit more um, neuroplastic. And that's one question. The other one is, 
have you noticed any difference between uh, people who are fakeic and people who are pseudo fakeic? This usually occurs in a elderly demographic, and often these patients either have cataracts or are pseudo fakeic. Okay, I can answer, and then Dr. Marcos will have we want to to comment as well. Uh, in our experience. There is not much difference. Um, let's say the elderly, they can have this great plasticity. They really improve. But we started to do children as well for other conditions. And also for amenopia, we are in our first case. But at least for the, the nystagmus, children seem to improve faster and better than uh, adults. So it can be something else for children. But the elderly improve very well. So uh, I don't know, Dr. Michael. <laughs> Alan, it's all about neuroplasticity, all the low vision, what you hear today, uh, in terms of macular degeneration or peripheral. Basically, it's perceptual training with different methods. Um, there is a big improvement now in our ability to train after we identify that um, ocular motor functions are disabled or reduced in the loss of vision, central or peripheral. But altogether, there, are more, there is more and more evidence with, um, uh, with MRIs um, that this is all brain plasticity. What you see here in the, in the studies, what we did today, it's in essence, um, the holy grail of stroke, restoration, rest, field restitution. We talked about that, that for many, many years. It could be done. Uh, not only what we proved are uh, quite a few studies which show true field restoration. Now, which brain is better? It's like good old wine, maybe the older one. We don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it's, um, but the truth is that um, uh, there, are, there is some evidence that the brain works better. Uh, we, we lose every, since the day we are born, we lose every day, like, I don't know, two, 300,000 neurons, and we still have. But apparently when there are too many neurons in the brain, there is too much noise, distorting our thought process. As we grow older, apparently, uh, the brain works better, works better for mm -hmm. training. So, um, yeah, there is some future for low vision, you see. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I've never noticed any differences between the fake and the fake patients. I, I don't know if Dr. McQuitz has an opinion. No. About uh, most of our patients are pseudo fake, what we see. We see very rarely patients uh, with cataracts or uh, what we see patients with cataracts or other things. But uh, the demographics, you know, most of the people at this stage are uh, pseudo fake. Um, just um, I see a question from Dr. Leacher. When do you start training the biofeedback after stroke? Probably I'd like to train after a couple of months because with three months, that's it. They're not going to recover that much. With two months, uh, if they didn't recover much, we can probably start helping the patient. It doesn't hurt. Uh, yeah. And also she asked the question, Dr. Marco, it's always uh, talk about this. Do prisms work for patients with early dementia or uh, decreased reading ability neglect, right, Dr. Marco? Yeah, well, um, uh, in stroke, basically, the, the first step one has to assess if there is neglect or not. And about 30% of patients they, uh, they do have neglect which stays there. So the approach is different. Uh, if there is neglect, basically there is a cognitive impairment and basically uh, uh, training or active training with, with patient involvement has less chances of success. The patient cannot, cannot do it uh, or remember or follow the instruction um, so therefore, uh, methods like um, uh, passive, uh, passive approach, like prescribing glasses and prisms, um, are more indicated for people um, with neglect.
but biofeedback training probably will um, will not work so well. Um, maybe I, I'll just say before we close everything, thank you um, Jenny and Marco for the excellent, and Julia for the excellent presentations and uh, Monica for putting it all together and leaving me just the comments at the end. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Dr. Marcus. <laughs> Yes, thank you very much all again for uh, for this. It's really quite fascinating what uh, what the brain is capable of doing in terms of compensating for um, these visual deficits. Uh, quite uh, quite fascinating work. So thank you very much, everybody. Great presentations, and we will uh, see you next week. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, guys. Have a great Friday. Thanks. Bye.